Sunday, November 6, 2005, Evansville, Indiana. What seemed just like another normal stormy night like any other, the civilians of the city were resting from the day before as the clouds of rain from above them, which seems completely normal. However, news and weather stations knew something sinister about these storms, making them think otherwise. And they were right. Shortly later, this would become the storm to drop the deadliest tornado of the 2000s decade. The deadly Evansville night tornado of 2005. So, what exactly led up to this event in the first place? Well, for that, we'll have to go back a day to the 5th, which was a humid and unseasonably warm day for early November in Indiana, with a high of 77 and a low of 58. Unusual warm weather like this can often happen before tornado events, and as I explain, you'll see why. The reason for this unseasonably warm weather is due to the Gulf of Mexico, which had brought a surge of warm and moisturized southerly flowing air near the surface, making temperatures rise in the southeastern part of the country, including southern Indiana. Because of the warm, humid air near the surface, this caused instability in the atmosphere, known as CAPE. Meanwhile, as the trough moved into the country at 500 millibars, about 18,000 feet, this caused a low pressure system located at 850 millibars, about 5,000 feet, which was present over Missouri at 6 p.m. on the 5th. Because of the low pressure system, the low level jet wind flow followed suit. But since there were already southerly winds near the surface, this resulted in wind shear along the low pressure system. As the cold front associated with the low pressure system moved through, it clashed with the warm, unstable air, thus creating thunderstorms along the cold front. And thanks to the wind shear, these thunderstorms can become tornadic, as long as our ingredients were strong enough. And spoiler alert, they were! While the National Weather Service was expecting these storms to happen, they issued a slight risk for Illinois, Indiana, and much of the surrounding states, which included a 5% for tornadoes to happen, with Evansville located on the edge of the 2% and the 5%. In case you don't know, the tornado percentage only means that there is a given chance for a tornado to occur within 25 miles of a certain point. For example, if you're located in a 5%, this means you have a 5% chance of a tornado to happen in a 25 mile proximity from you. Now with these parameters in place, we now know that this area has a chance for severe weather, and at around 6pm is when storms started to fire along the cold front in Missouri, moving east, and was dropping our first tornadoes of the outbreak a few hours later. But it wasn't until just after midnight when the National Weather Service in Paducah, Kentucky, Notice a mildly concerning area of rotation. The rotation wasn't really a huge draft for quite a while, as no reports of anything came from it. However, just a little over an hour of the rotation stayed pretty quiet, the rotation became quite concerning. This was because atmospheric conditions in Evansville were perfect for tornadoes, as the squall storms came through. Dew points were in the low 60s and temperatures in the low 70s. Wind shear was up to 60 knots, which is well over the needed amount of wind shear. Meanwhile, the Cape values were relatively low, with about 1,000 joules per kilogram. But since this was November, the storms were able to work with this. And at 1.32 a.m. is when the first tornado warning was put out for Henderson and Posey County by Kristen Welgas, who was lead forecaster and warning coordinator meteorologist at NWS Paducah. It wasn't until a few moments later at 1.39, it's when the tornado finally touched down in Henderson County, Kentucky, just a few miles north of the community of Smith Mills. The tornado was moving northeast and became quite powerful rather quickly, already causing EF2 and EF3 damage as it hit its first structure, resulting in a tossed truck and a destroyed farmhouse, all in less than a minute after touchdown. Thankfully, no one was killed in the house. About a third of a mile later, the tornado struck its next structure before crossing the Ohio River. And at 1.47, a new tornado warning was issued for southern parts of Vanderburg County, Indiana, 
but a few minutes later, a special weather statement was sent out in the tornado warned area, updating that Evansville, Indiana could be in the path of this possible tornado. Possible meaning that the NWS at the time wasn't sure if this was a confirmed tornado on the ground. Anyways, for the next little bit, the tornado was able to cross the Ohio River two more times due to the windiness of the river. During this time, the tornado went through this peninsula known as Union Township. Not much happened here as ground scouring tree damage and some structural damage took place, including a house with roof damage and embedded twigs piercing the house, along with destruction to heavy farm equipment. But once it left Union Township and finally crossed the river for the last time, is when things really started going south. The tornado had struck its first major structure, Ellis Park, located in Henderson County, Kentucky, along the Indiana-Kentucky state line. This horse racing track suffered significant damage, unfortunately resulting in the deaths of several horses. After striking Ellis Park, the tornado crossed the state line back into Indiana for the last time, making a beeline for Eastbrook Mobile Home Park. During this time, a new tornado warning was issued for Warwick County, Indiana, and just a minute after Warwick County's warning was set out, the first damage reports came in from Ellis Park from moments ago, confirming to the NWS and the public that there is indeed a tornado on the ground. We have reports now of uh, significant damage at Ellis Park. Okay, so now we are now we are now getting reports, folks, that this may very well be a tornado. However, confirming the tornado wouldn't matter because as the reports came in, the tornado finally reached Eastbrook Mobile Home Park at 2 a.m. This is unfortunately where things would take a turn for the worse. 20 people here in Eastbrook had died from the tornado and over 200 mobile homes were either damaged or destroyed. The reason why this was so deadly was because of two main reasons. The first one being that it was night. Not many people are awake and aware of the tornado that's coming right at them. The other thing is that mobile homes are not sturdy structures to be in during a tornado. They can't even handle tornadoes as weak as an F1. So pure travesty was bound to happen in Eastbrook, as the satellite just did. The tornado only stayed in the mobile home park for about a minute, and as it was leaving the park, two and a half miles away at the Deaconess Hospital, a webcam captured the only known photo of the actual tornado itself, appearing to be a large cone. Pretty unnerving. The worst of the event may be over, but the rough journey only continues. The tornado is now entering the urbanized residential parts of Warwick County in the city of Newburgh. Here in Warwick County is where the worst damage would occur, the intensity being high-end EF3, almost borderline F4, on the original Fujita scale, with the highest wind speeds getting up to 200 miles per hour. The tornado finally left the dense urban areas of Newburgh, mostly going over rather rural areas for the remainder of the tornado's lifetime. This doesn't mean the tragedy is over yet, however. Despite the city of Boonville being spared by the tornado, only grazing the southern part of the city, a teenage girl in this area was sadly killed in a vehicle. At 2.11 a.m., the last warning for this tornado was issued for Spencer County. But four minutes later, the tornado arrived in Degonia Springs, where a mobile home with a family of three and an expected baby the next month would all unfortunately perish. Thankfully, the nightmare was ending as the tornado quickly weakened and dissipated back into the clouds after crossing into Spencer County, just before hitting the town of Gentryville at 2.24 a.m. The ending of the tornado is great news for sure, but only revealed the next part of this harrowing experience, the aftermath. 24 people had just lost their lives that night, one of them being in a vehicle and the rest in mobile homes. Another person in the hospital died a month later from the traumatic injuries, adding one more fatality. In total, 25 have passed away, and over 230 people were injured from this tornado. Even though there are survivors, climbing out of rubble is another challenge they have to face, such as the dangers of power lines, gas leaks, and sharp objects, which can be fatal. 
Other challenges they're left to face with are the loss of their homes, loved ones, cherished items, supplies, and overall livelihoods. The same thing applies with the injured. They also too have to deal with injuries, with some of their injuries being lifelong. As the sun rose all along the tornado's path, destruction was seen as far as the eye can see, spanning all the way from Henderson County to Spencer County, with the hardest impacted areas without a doubt being Eastbrook Mobile Home Park and Newburgh. Over 500 homes and buildings had been severely damaged or destroyed. When the NWS got to investigate the tornado, they found that it had tracked 41 miles and lasted 45 minutes. They preliminarily rated an F3 due to the severity of the damage, which later became official. The peak wind speeds had topped out at 200 miles per hour, with the width of the tornado being on average 270 yards wide, and at its widest point, 500 yards, about three tenths of a mile wide. In the end, this had become the deadliest tornado in Indiana since the 1974 super outbreak and in the U.S. since 1999 at the time, also becoming the deadliest in the 2000s decade, which really makes me question why this tornado is rather forgotten, even in the weather community, especially since this can be a great example for how deadly these situations can be for trailer parks and night tornadoes. But what about the outbreak overall? The outbreak itself is what you expect from a 5%, which is not too many tornadoes, with this one extending from Arkansas to Ohio, with only a few injuries coming from other tornadoes. However, just a few days later, the Kentucky and Evansville area couldn't seem to catch a break. Just less than two weeks later on the 15th, another system was in place for the same area, and it was much more dangerous. This time it included a rare high risk. Only six of these have been seen in the month of November before this. The high risk included a hatch 25% tornado risk, with Evansville located within it. Will Evansville get hit again? Thankfully, no. But other areas in Kentucky were affected. An F3 near Benton, Kentucky did take a life and injured at least 10 people. Another notable tornado was an F4 near Madisonville that injured 40 others. Thankfully, it wasn't as deadly as what happened in Evansville days prior, but was a very close call indeed. Before I officially end the video, I have some announcements to make, with the first one being that we now have a Discord server if you want to join it. Link in the description. The other thing is that I also do have a Twitter. I'm more active over there, so next time if I leave for two months, hopefully that won't happen again. But anyways, you'll know where to find me. So other than that, thanks for watching.